Thanks for joining us for CBN News Today. I'm Charlene Aaron. The president finally has a plan to defeat the ISIS terrorists in Iraq and Syria. Soon he'll be ready to tell the nation what those plans are. Dale Hurd has the story. President Obama has finally decided what the U.S. should do to defeat the terrorist of the so-called Islamic State in the Middle East. We are going to degrade and ultimately defeat ISIL the same way that we have gone after al-Qaeda. But on Meet the Press Sunday, the president I'm said he still believes the Islamic State is not an immediate threat to the United States and he won't send U.S. combat troops back to Iraq. I want everybody to understand that we have not seen any immediate intelligence about uh, threats to the homeland from ISIL. That's not what this is about. Members of Congress were relieved but critical that the president took so long to form a strategy. Well, I want to congratulate the president. He is now on the offense. It is overdue, but the president is now there. There's been some confusion coming out of the administration. This is the toughest talk that we've heard from the president. And I, I agree with Senator Feinstein. That's a good thing uh, because they are a threat. And Senator and I see all this intelligence, and that's uh, very, been very, very concerning for us. Former Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney was not as charitable toward the president's slowness in crafting a strategy. Well, I, I think the president is really out of touch with reality when it comes to what's happening in the world. He is so out of touch with reality that he hasn't taken the kind of action necessary to prevent very bad things from happening. Meanwhile, in Cairo, the Arab League recognizes the threat of the Islamic State, urging members to confront the group militarily and politically. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Christians in Lebanon are taking up arms to protect themselves from a potential threat by ISIS. Lebanese believers have watched nervously as Christians in Syria and Iraq were forced to flee their homes and villages as ISIS takes more territory. Now the militant Muslim army poses a threat to Lebanon. ISIS forces are cha clashing with Lebanese security forces and kidnapping soldiers and policemen. They've already publicly beheaded two captured soldiers. Lebanese Christians believe they'll have to defend themselves. It is the first time they've taken up arms since the end of the civil war in 1990. Well, Lebanon is not the only country worried that ISIS will continue to take more ground. Our Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has more from Jordan. Jordan is a major tourist destination. Each year, millions of tourists flock to famous sites like Petra. I think Petra is amazing. I think it truly is one of the wonders of the world. But now Jordan finds itself on the front lines with IS, the Islamic State. This is the last major town in Jordan before you go to Iraq. This road leads straight to the border. And now on the other side, Sunni troops supported by ISIS control that crossing. The group's aggressive moves toward Jordan's border have many worried about the future of King Abdullah and Jordan, also known as the Hashemite Kingdom. In this video, Jordanians fighting for the Islamic State in Iraq tore up their passports and pledged to slaughter the king. From their point of view, Jordan's an artificial country that has to be removed. Next stop is Israel. Looking at the map, Jordan shares a long border with both Syria and Iraq. You can also see Jordan serves as a buffer on Israel's eastern border. In the vast desert to the north, the Jordanians maintain a strong, well-armed and trained military. But Israeli analyst Jonathan Fine sees Jordan's real threat coming from the inside, not its border. The danger is embedded in the potential of Muslim Brotherhood supporters, among them also Palestinians, who might cling and adhere to the ideology of the IS in, uh, uh, in Iraq. Hopefully, Jordan won't face this enemy. It has two strong allies in the U.S. and Israel. I don't think that I'm uh, exaggerating that both Israel and the U.S. will prevent any takeover of IS on Jordan. Because from an Israeli point of view, the Eastern Front has always been a very sensitive issue. That's why Israel feels is vital to control the Jordan Valley on its eastern border. But the threat goes far beyond the borders of the Hashemite Kingdom. In their eyes, the definition of the enemy is Western civilization, not a foreign policy of one government or another. And when they say they, uh, uh, they target the Judeo Crusade Alliance as their major enemy, they mean what they're saying. For now, Jordan, usually a quiet political player, sits on the front lines, part of the new reality in an ever-changing Middle East. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Northern Jordan. 
Here at home, Dr. Rick Sakra, the third American missionary infected with Ebola, is showing signs of improvement. However, specialists at the Nebraska Medical Center where he's being treated say it's too soon to say if he will recover. Doctors say he's more responsive. Sakra's family read to him from the Bible through a video link outside his isolation unit, and he asked for a Bible to be brought in. Meanwhile, President Obama says helping contain the Ebola outbreak in West Africa is a U.S. national security priority. If we don't make that effort now, and this spreads not just through Africa, but other parts of the world, there's the prospect then that the virus mutates, it becomes more easily transmittable, and then it could be a serious danger to the United States. The president added it will be months before the outbreak is controllable in Africa. Doctors are concerned about a mystery virus that sickened more than 1,000 children could become a nationwide outbreak. Symptoms start out like the common cold, but then quickly get worse, sending kids to the hospital because they can't breathe. The CDC suspects it's a rare virus called human intervirus 68, but it hasn't been officially identified yet. A hospital in Colorado has seen more than 900 patients so far, and one in Kansas City has reported more than 300 cases. Doctors say children under five years old and those with asthma are the most vulnerable. Well, can you imagine health care without your doctor, the one who knows you so well? Last week, we did a story on the pressure from big government that's causing many doctors to close their doors. But reporter Caitlin Burke recently interviewed Dr. Peter Anderson of Team Care Medicine. He says he's come up with a way to keep doctors in business. Now, you're actually an advocate. Why are you an advocate of EMR? As our population has aged over these last 30 years, now the typical patient has two to 300 data points. They have 10 or 15 medications, five or six chronic diseases, and five or 10 different kind of symptoms. There's no way paper can take care of that. Basically, paper's archaic if you want to give competent care. For me to organize two or three hundred data points to keep track of them, and then also to make that data available to hospitals, specialists, after hours, or when the patient travels, it, it has to be on the EMR. So when doctors want to moder modernize their, their practice, what is it that you suggest that they do now? The key is you don't put the doctor on the EMR. When was the last time you saw the judge get off the bench and go do the stenographer's work? You would destroy our judicial system if the judge took over the stenographer's work. And that's what we've done in medicine. As our primary care network has been overwhelmed, patients have gone without care or care has been really expensive. And just to give you an example, if they can't see me for a cold, they go to the emergency room. For me, that's, it could be a $100 visit. That's a lot of money. For emergency room, a cold costs $1,200. EMR is essential, but at the same time, if you don't use it right, it has the ability to destroy your practice. And the ones that lo lose the most are the patients. So I would say the very answer to that is the innovation inside the exam room. So you've come up with team care medicine. Tell me a little bit about that. So I'm working 12 hours a day, I'm $80,000 in the red, and I'm turning away patients. I say, you know, it doesn't make any sense. I've just got to get more efficient. And, the, you know, the nurse surgeon team in the OR, I said, you know, how come I can't have a team like the surgeon does? If I had a team inside that exam room, I could change my exam room process, maybe do a, see more patients, do it quicker, never expecting to improve care. And so I said, I, I told my nurse, you're gonna stay in this visit the entire time. And I'm gonna teach you to do everything that I don't have to do. I mean, I wanna do, I, I want to do what a physician does, but I do not wanna do what somebody else can do. And so they, my nurses were scared, I was scared, we were desperate. Three years later, I went home and told my wife, she had seen that our productivity had gone up. I was back up to 30 patients a day, so she, the finances were getting corrected. But three years after the change, I told my wife, I've never given this kind of quality. I was working less. I was uh, making a lot more money, paying the bills. And, and I actually was enjoying medicine again. I had truthfully fallen in love with medicine again. 
Dr. Anderson, thank you for being with us. The Familiar Physician is available on Amazon.com. Churches and groups of different denominations in Utah are asking the Supreme Court to settle whether states can outlaw gay marriage. Religious groups from evangelical, Catholic and Mormon churches are asking the high court to uphold religious freedom. A statement from the group's group says the time has come to end the divisive national debate as to whether the Constitution mandates same sex marriage. Meanwhile, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco will hear arguments on gay marriage bans in Idaho, Nevada and Hawaii today. S. Truett Cathy, the founder of the Chick-fil-A restaurant chain, passed away early this morning at the age of 93. A company spokesman said Cathy died at home surrounded by family members. The first Chick-fil-A opened in Atlanta, Georgia in 1967, and in the following decades, it has expanded to more than 1,800 stores in 39 states. The chain store has been known for its biblical values and being closed on Sundays to allow employees a day of rest. In recent years, it also drew attention for its rejection of gay marriage. Coming up, celebrating 20 years of broadcasting good news to the nations. The stories from across the globe that have changed lives and lifted up the church. The Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram is capturing more towns in northern Nigeria in its efforts to establish an Islamic caliphate there. Insurgents using stolen military trucks took three towns along the border with Cameroon this weekend. The radical Islamic group is taking over churches in territories it has conquered. Religion News Service reports that Nigerian officials say Boko Haram is beheading men and forcing Christian women to convert to Islam to be taken as wives. Sudan's Islamic government shut down a 500-member church in Khartoum, the capital. Morningstar News reports security agents padlocked the doors of the Sudan Pentecostal Church in late August. One person said church leaders are worried the state might try to confiscate and sell the building. The church has been in existence for more than 20 years. Morningstar reports this is the latest in a wave of church closures, confiscations and demolitions in Khartoum. Well, CBN's Christian World News program focuses on telling stories about the church around the world. This week, the show celebrates 20 years of broadcasting. For its special anniversary program, it turns the cameras around to tell our viewers about the show and the people behind it, including this look at the mission of Christian it, World It News. really blazed a trail when it comes to doing Christian news about whether it be persecution, revival movements, humanitarian events that are going on. I think of the typhoon that hit the Philippines. Utter devastation. Oh my gosh. The eye wall of Typhoon Haiyan came right here. But you know what brings hope to people? Is when they see believers on the ground. They roll up their sleeves, they begin to get their hands dirty, and they, you demonstrate the, the church at work. God's heart is for the global church, and He cares about the people that are in the uttermost parts of the world. And those are the stories that we bring to people. This is the one time in the entire year that you can actually get to this remote part of the Siberian tundra, because what we are on right now is a huge frozen lake. God has given us the special vehicle to use television, to use the internet, to say, don't give up. In the midst of your challenges, in the midst of your persecution, God is still on the throne. And look at the story of how others are suffering, but yet they thrive and they continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can't think of another show other than Christian World News that has focused so much on Saeed Abedini and his imprisonment in Iran. And I had the great opportunity to interview his wife, Nagme. As, as a wife, what's been the hardest part of all of this for you? The Lord has given me grace to go to his presence and just get my comfort. And, and uh, but as a mom, every, it's just every time is this like a stab <laughs> in my heart when I see them struggling and I can't do anything about it. We can call on our viewers to pray and we know they are praying. So we know Christian World News is making a difference in so many fronts, not just informing people, but also a call to action and a call to prayer. When a billion plus believers who call themselves Christian gather together across the globe to pray, does MSNBC cover it? No. CBS? No. ABC? Does it lead the nightly news? No. But it leads Christian World News. 
Christians across the globe come together to ask God to bless their countries and the world. It's the worst humanitarian crisis in the world today, and they've sought refuge in places like this camp. This is not just for the Christian, uh, for the believers. It's also for non-Christians because people in villages, say in India or somewhere in the Middle East, they've never even met a Christian, but they have this idea that Christians are bad. They can't trust them. Suddenly they see what Christians are doing. They see what they're like. It's pre-evangelism. Their hearts are softened, and then they're ready for the gospel. And you can see the full anniversary edition of Christian World News and some special web extras. Just go to our page, cbnnews.com, and click on the Christian World News link. Up next, meet the movie-making brothers behind Facing the Giants, Courageous and Fireproof, and hear the supernatural secret to their box office success. Well, you may have seen their movies, but you might not know their names. Brother Alex, brothers Alex and Stephen Kendrick are making waves in Hollywood. Their biggest films, Facing the Giants, Fireproof and Courageous, have grossed nearly $80 million with a combined budget of less than $4 million. Here's their remarkable story. Filmmakers Alex and Stephen Kendrick developed a love for making movies when they were just kids. When we were growing up, we didn't have a television for a while, and uh, but our parents would take us to see Disney films. And so we got excited about wanting to, to get into filmmaking one day. We were doing stop and go animation flip books we were with our Hardy Boys books at home. Uh, we got a little stop and go animation eight millimeter camera when I think Alex was in fourth grade at the time and then a video camera when they came out in our teenage years in the 80s and so uh, it's been a part of our lives from the beginning. Raised by Christian parents, they are especially passionate about producing films with a faith message. Sherwood Baptist Church in the small town of Albany, Georgia gave them that opportunity. The brothers help with the church's media ministry and today serve as associate pastors. Uh, we love our church family at Sherwood. They've been very supportive with us from the beginning. Flywheel, their first film, tells the story of a dishonest used car salesman who comes to grips with his need for God. Produced on a bare bones budget, it ran in their local theater for six weeks. We have a warrant for your arrest. They went on to write and produce three more films, with brother Alex in the director's chair. Facing the Giants, Courageous and Fireproof have grossed nearly $80 million, with a combined budget of less than $4 million. Fireproof, a movie about restoring marriage, became the highest grossing independent film of 2008. Love Dare, its accompanying devotional, has sold more than three and a half million copies. The success of these little-known Christian filmmakers has left Hollywood scratching its head. The Kendricks credit prayer for their accomplishments. Every one of our movies is a whole string of miracles where the Lord would step up and provide exactly what we needed, the cash, the crew, the locations, the protection, the storyline, the truths to communicate. And so um, when we look up on the scene, uh, when we look up on the screen, we see the body of Christ. No amount of skill can manufacture the favor of God. And so we need the Lord's favor to say, you know, I want to bless this film. Where the Lord says, I'm going to do things you cannot do in your own power. The same thing he did with Joshua and Gideon and Moses and so many others. CBN News was invited here on the set for the latest Kendrick film, which they hope inspires Christians around the globe to pray. Each of our films has a theme that we felt like the Lord led us to, uh, uh, led us to make a movie about. This time it was on the power of prayer. And to, uh, and, and to remind um, believers that we must not only pray, but sometimes do battle in prayer. This fifth project, a family drama simply known as Movie 5, features Priscilla Shirer, best-selling author, Bible teacher, and daughter of Pastor Tony Evans. Making her big screen debut, Shirer shared what it was like working with the Kendricks on set. We've just had a great time getting the job done, but just being lighthearted and fun in the process. And to see their patience, oh gosh, Alex as a director has to be so patient while lighting gets it right and while the cameras get their uh, focus and while the actors are make sure they have their lines and he's got all these moving parts and to watch him in the midst of that swirling hurricane, be patient with all those dynamics, basically he's, he's shown us what leadership is. Movie 5 also marks their first project produced under the newly formed Kendrick Brothers Films. The Lord 
told us, expand your filmmaking beyond Sherwood's walls and take what you've learned under the leadership of Michael Catt and under the support of the church and try to impact the body of Christ, networking with young Christian filmmakers from across the nation so that they're learning too how to make God honoring films. According to a recent survey, more than half of Americans want more movies with Christian values. To feed that growing demand, major studios are taking a leap of faith with biblical epics such as Noah, the upcoming release of Exodus, and a remake of Ben-Hur. It's paying off. During April of 2014, four faith-based movies made the top 20 at the box office. That trend excites the Kendricks. We're grateful that the platform for Christian films is getting larger and more and more talented and, and God-fearing filmmakers are jumping into this arena and making films with strong, bold messages. And so we're seeing audiences respond. And so the more that come out, we know that it's, there's a groundswell. And so we're grateful for that. We're excited to be among them doing that. And so, you know, when you hear movies that proclaim God's truth, that proclaim the gospel and do it without compromise, without watering it down, we're, we're cheering them on. And we are cheering the Kindred song. Can't wait till that movie comes out in um, the fall of next year. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. Finally today, a gigantic asteroid just barely missed Earth over the weekend. Nicknamed Pitbull, the giant chunk of rock measured 60 feet, roughly the same size as a small house. It was so big that if it had hit the Earth, the results would have been disastrous. Scientists only spotted it about a week ago. In 2013, a space rock about the same size blasted through the atmosphere over Russia, causing considerable damage. NASA said Pitbull was a close call but posed no risk. Thank God for that. Well, that's it for now on CBN News Today. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. And tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do that on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. We hope you join us next time. Have a great day and God bless.